uh, we have been talking about the Ten Commandments. Now, the Ten Commandments, guess what? We've been doing, we started at, at one, and this is our last one. Can you guess which one it is? Number 10, exactly. You get to go to the front of the class. Uh, we have covered one through nine. And again, if you are uh, just joining us or if you're watching us online, you can go to our YouTube page and you can go back and catch up on any of those, one, one through nine, uh, just backtrack, and, and they're all there. So um, before we get to the next one, I, I do want to have a little bit of, of, of word that some of these commandments that we have gone through, we've tried to give them a different look. We've, we've tried to give them just a different view in a sense that they are not, uh, some of us, if we've grown up in a church and things like that, we might see the commandments as, as, a, as a scolding or as a lecture or as a big no-no. And what we want to remind ourselves was is that the Ten Commandments came to us for a reason. It became to, came to us because God wanted a relationship with us. He wanted a relationship with us, and he wanted to give us ideas and pointers of how to begin a community, of how to begin the church, of how to treat each other in loving kindness. And as we hear the commandments back then, we will be able to see how that evolves into the words of of Jesus Christ and how Jesus Christ has helped us to evolve and see things a little bit differently. That being said, some of these uh, commandments sound pretty dated. And so we're going to talk about that just a little bit. Uh, this one, the last one, Exodus 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, uh-oh, uh, or male or female slave, holy, uh, or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. I have no problem with a donkey, but to the rest of this, um, there, there are some things in, in our scripture that are a little bit uh, dated, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk about that. So uh, if you are looking at this commandment and going, Ugh, let me tell you, you're not alone, and I believe you're supposed to look at it that way. So, uh, but before this, I want to... I just want to talk about the, the coveting of something um, means the desire, the want to have something. But if you go back and talk about the, 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 the Hebrew translation and the way that it's written and stuff, it actually means even a little bit more than that. They're talking about um, you should not um, scheme to get something. Uh, it's not just the desire of saying, oh, I like that. It's actually the thought of, can I scheme my way to acquire that, to, to steal that? From my neighbor to take that which is not really mine, but to want something so bad that you're willing to uh, sacrifice uh, values, morals, all of that kind of stuff just to get it. And so that's what we're kind of talking about. Um, I may not look it, but I was a child of the 70s. That's my uh, era. It was a great time to be alive. You had uh, you could go from uh, listening to Led Zeppelin to Olivia Newton-John. The world was wide open, and it was just full of possibilities. Uh, we had disco, we had Grease, we had John Travolta in several different movies. Um, but the greatest show in the world, the greatest show ever, was Starsky and Hutch. There was no better show than these guys right here. They had the car, they had the hair, one of them even came out with an album that is awful, but they still, they tried. And they would drive sporadically and wild. I remember the beginning was always them in this beautiful car just coming, the, the car is about the size of this church, but it's, they come flying around the corner and they didn't care if there were pedestrians or signals or anything like that and they would just speed out of control and all that kind of stuff. And as a kid, we just loved this show. Uh, I grew up, uh, I have a, a, a brother uh, and he, we were, we were fraternal twins. I still are, but he doesn't like to, he doesn't like to admit it. So we, we, uh, but he had um, blonde straight hair, and I had dark curly hair. I had hair. Uh, I, there's pictures, but uh, we, and so he was always Hutch, and I was always Starsky, and we would play uh, Starsky and Hutch all the time. And then it even got better. There was a, a company called Mego, and Mego made uh, action figures, not dolls, action figures. 
and they would make them about anything that you could ever desire. Speaking of John Travolta, they had Welcome Back Cotter action figures. Uh, and nobody knows what Welcome Back Cotter is these days, but they didn't do much action, but they were figures. And they came out with Starsky and Hutch action figures. Not dolls, but you could actually get the car for this too. They would fit in the car. You had, you had Starsky, you had Hutch, you had uh, one of the characters' name was Huggy Bear. You had some of the, uh, the bad guys and all this kind of stuff. And you could create this world of Starsky and Hutch. You had the, I mean, the car. You had the car. You could take that car and just throw it out into traffic like they do and just play with this. But I never got any of that stuff. For some reason, I never uh, was able to get any of those. And I had a cousin. We always have a cousin. Every one of us has a cousin that just gets everything. And you would walk into his house, and it would be like walking into Toys R Us. He just had, you know, all of the things of, of everything. He had the action figures of, of all the shows. He had Superman, Batman, Welcome Back, Cotter. Uh, he had all of those. He had a Fonzie doll that would go like this when you put the lever in his back, you know. He had all of that, and he had the car, he had Starsky and Hutch, and I would go over there and just look at him and just be in awe and think, I want that. Because this is what I had to play with when I was a kid. When you wanted to play Starsky and Hutch, this is, this is what I had. I had a plastic Corvette that was about this big and didn't do nothing. Uh, and the... To, the the driver, I didn't have Starsky, I didn't have Hutch, I didn't have Superman, I had an eraser of W.C. Fields. <laughs> How pathetic is that? W.C. Fields is a, uh, an old comedian uh, from the 30s, uh, and there was a commercial that they would take a cartoon image of him, and he sold uh, Fritos chips. And every once in a while, they would have this promotion where if you bought this uh, Fritos, you would get this W.C. Fields inside of it. And, and no kidding, he was about that, that tall. Starsky and Hutch were like this. W.C. Fields was like this. The car was like this. And so uh, that's what I played with. And I'd be in my room playing, you know, with the, the, the and I would be pretending, you know, there'd be a, you know, oh, there's trouble in, in Littlewood or whatever the town would be. And then W.C. Fields would just jump to action and waddle over into the car. And I would try to work him into the car, but the, 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 it was a little small, so I had to kind of wedge him in there and stuff. It, what, he wasn't jumping into the car. He was kind of just oozing into the car, wedging into the car. And then you'd have to drive them around and everything like that. And I would kept thinking to myself, uh, that doesn't look anything like Starsky or Hutch. Um, but somehow or another, when you're a kid, you, you make it work. Uh, you, you are graced with this thing called imagination. And my world might not have matched the world that I had an idea of in my head, but it was fun. It was, at times, hilarious. It was, at times, so joyful. Uh, and it wasn't until you're... Sometimes you, you need hindsight. You need to step out of where you were. And the a, older I got, the more I was able to look back and cherish that moment of being able to imagine and being able to just play and have fun with what I had. And it was beautiful. I found that, you know, my, my career path took me, you know, I, uh, I was an entertainer for uh, a number of years and, and, and a writer and things like that. And none of that would have been, went, would have been possible if I didn't have that uh, imagination, that creativity. If you ever watch any actors today, uh, you're just watching people pretend, you know. Uh, Wonder Woman, not that. She's just pretending that she's Wonder Woman. Um, but they just have... Uh, the, the jobs that I had, the, 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 what I did with my life relied so much on the, the imagination. And I'm not sure that imagination would have grown as much as it did had I had everything laid out for me. If I had every story laid out for me, if I had the official gear. But to actually stretch it further than that with the limitations of what I had helped me to grow and evolve to where I am. 
And sometimes we don't realize the things that we have in this world are exactly the things that we need in this world. We live so much in a time now where we look at something and we think, you know, if I just had that, that would make me happy. If I just lived there, I'd be much happier then. If I had what they had, I'd be happier then. And then it even goes into, if I was just like them, I'd be happier. The thing that we don't, the thing that we forget, and again, some of us have heard this as childhood, Jesus loves me and all of this kind of stuff, but how many times have we actually really focused on the fact that you are a creation of God, that God created you? And I really want us to ponder that. You, you know, you, you take time for pauses and reflection and stuff. I really want us to let that sink in, that you have been created by God. That means, that means that who you are is cherishable. That means that who you are is who God made you to be. We often look at, in the church, boy, we've done a bad job of this, of saying, uh, you are welcome here, but you have to change everything about you. You have to change your identity, and you have to change who you are. Because we are coveting that. I do, I do believe that we are people that, uh, as I am, uh, I, I am, I'm loved by, by Christ. And I, I do believe that I'm meant to grow. And I do believe I've, I'm, I'm meant to evolve and to expand on who I am and to take uh, myself further in the path. But again, it's taking who I am to further that path. It's not changing everything about me. We have, we have people that have... Uh, that struggle uh, with all kinds of things in this world uh, because of not feeling accepted or welcomed in this world. And they learn to think that if, uh, okay, it's so hard for me because I, I feel this way. This is who I identify at, but they tell me that I can't be that way in order for God to love me. God made you. God made you as you are. God made you as a shining example of who you are. We don't have to look beyond or, or think that we're supposed to be the way that they tell us to be. We can be and celebrate who we are and how we identify and who we love. Because remember, the easiest thing to do when you follow Christ is simply to love. And that message that Christ gave us was a message of love, of acceptance, of kindness, of uh, stopping everything that you're doing on the path to talk to somebody regardless of who they are and to welcome them and to build a community with them and to be part of the church with them, and to take the special parts of them, the uniqueness of them, the individuality of them, and bring that and create a neighborhood of Christ. If we didn't do that, and believe me, we've tried not to do that in the church's history. We implode among ourselves because we tried to just look for mimics instead of originality, instead of individuality. We try to look at what the other church has or what the other people have, and we say we need to be exactly like them. When God is saying, you have what I've given you and what I have made, do you appreciate it? Do we appreciate people for who they are? And furthermore, do we appreciate ourselves for who we are? For who we see ourselves as, for who we're meant to be, for who God created us to be. Do we see that? We look at the, I was talking about the, uh, the commandment here, and it does look quite archaic. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. Okay. 
you should not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, at the time that this was written, women were treated in the same sentence as an ox or a donkey. They were treated as property. People did have slaves. Uh, sometimes they were slaves of like if, uh, if I had a debt that I owed you, I would work for you and work it off, but they also just had slaves. Uh, people were treated quite poorly back then. And we look at this and we think that's not okay. And the reason that we look at it and think that's not okay is because we have taken this, but we have grown from it. And we have added a, a part of it that is called Christ. And if we follow Christ, we know that Christ was about welcoming, about accepting, about loving, about treating people with dignity, kindness, and respect. And if we do that, we know that this doesn't make sense to us anymore. But what if there's a signal in here? What if there's just a minute uh, atom of the whole piece there, a little, a little nugget, a little seed being planted? Because you see, God knows that when he planted things back then, that they were supposed to grow. And that means evolve, and that means work, and that means not rely on the archaicness, but actually to grow with it of the original message. And that original message, as we can look at it today, is that you don't own people. You don't own people. You cannot scheme your way to take advantage of people. Can we look at this commandment today as that? The thing that we have are the things that God gave us, and we are not to be owned. We are not to be bullied. We are not to abuse. We are to love one another. Could God at that time be planting the seed that the reason that you can't covet these because they don't belong to anybody? That what you have is worth sharing, but what you want is not always worth taking. You know, people look at the Ten Commandments and they think, why isn't there anything about like uh, assault and abuse and bullying and, uh, you know, uh, sexual assault and, 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 well, maybe a seed was planted here. Maybe a seed of that we do not are not meant to look at people as something that we can own. And furthermore, that means that if we don't own them, that means that we can't close the door on them. That means that we can't tell them whether or not God likes them. That means that we cannot tell them that they are needed to be something else because we don't own them. What we share this world with are people that are created by God. You are created by God. We have everything that we need. And the things that we need most in this world, Christ gives us, and that is love. Now the question is, if we call ourselves Christians, what do we do with that? Do we look around still coveting everything? Do we still look about scheming? Do we still want that power? Do we still try to tell somebody that uh, they can't be who they are? Or do we see Christ as a message of love and know that that means keeping that door open and inviting people in and cherishing them for who they are? I, Will's going to play about 20 seconds here, but I, I just want us to ponder this question. What is it that we covet in this world? Now, covet, remember, means uh, I want that. I scheme to have that. If I only had that, what is it that we're coveting in this world? What is it that's getting in the way and creating an illusion rather than allowing us to celebrate who we are and what we have? Let's just take 20 seconds on that, and then Will will sing a song for us. You know, there's a time when uh, in the summer churches tend to dip and COVID has really given us a, a hit as like churches all across the United States and everyone's coming up with different things like if you just did this or if you had this or if you just built this or anything like this. But my question is, is what if we actually just 
celebrated what we have and expanded on that. Love. What if we acknowledged that Christ is love, plain and simple, and just grew on that? That we loved people uh, as they are. That we celebrated people uh, through their identities. That we celebrated people for who they love. That we celebrated people for whatever story they have come with. That we celebrated people for whatever uh, nationality or culture or color of the skin or anything. What if we just celebrated? What if we just became a church that spreads love? May that be our mission. May that be our future. Because that is the kingdom of God. Love God. Love yourself. Love your neighbor. Amen.